value until value t, then it drops to zero. Can all functions be generalized like that? As in the x, the x or the input impulse be as a, because it's attached to the u of t, uh, be generalized as some function that will go up at, to, to some value t at zero and then the u of t minus tau be just changed by what value of t. I, I kind of got lost there. Let me, let me ask the, uh, firstly, I think you're asking about not the graphical portion, but I think you're talking about the, the convolution equation, which is that the output is equal to the input convolved with the system's impulse response. So we can write that as a integral equation and we can say it's equal to x of tau times h of t minus tau d tau. Now, what I wrote, what I've written so far, those two lines are true no matter what the input is and no matter what the impulse response looks like. It even works in bizarre universes where you can have an output before where the system can create an output before the input even arrives. So you, with a non-causal H of T, an H of T that is non-zero before T equals zero. So this, these two things are, are completely general equations. Now for this class and for all undergraduate versions of signals and systems, our H of T will always be right-sided. which is a, a fancy pants way of saying that it's going to be mo something multiplied by a U of T. My handwriting there is not that great. Let me try that again. Something multiplied by a U of T. Our input for this class will also be uh, in general right-sided, but it doesn't have to be. The, the integral equation works equally well either way. Does that answer your question, Tom? Uh, not not necessarily, but I'll okay. uh, I'll just wait and see if I can figure it out. The no, question. ask again. So I don't know if you can see these two graphs. Oh, let me see. So the two graphs of just the basic impulse ones, from like the first one, the homework, how u of tau just goes up to a certain value at zero, and then u of t minus tau goes down to zero at certain time t. Yes. Right, so, and then when you rewrite the integral from zero to t. Yes. So is that how you would generalize all of these uh, two signal convolutions? So your question is, You're again, you're, you're talking about the math portion and you're saying that for all the exam, from almost all the examples that we do, the questions will be, yes, for all the questions we're going to do in this class, the questions will be right-sided. And that means that your input will always look something like this. If you go fur further enough to the left, it will be zero. And at some point on the right, it'll turn on, I don't know where, maybe for a particular one, it'll do something like, like, uh, like this. Maybe it's uh, gonna be a step. You know, in this particular case, it might be, the input might be U of T minus two. So it turned on at two. And then our impulse response will also always be right-sided. Might not look like this, it might be it might be another step and maybe our impulse response will turn on at one. And although I've drawn them both as steps just to make the discussion simpler, um, they certainly might not be steps. They might be steps times, times something. So I think your question is, is your question about the math about how to do this or 
about how to handle the if we if we once we plug this in this we would derive this we would say it's equal to u of t minus one so here our y of t would be equal to our integral of x of tau so our x of tau would be u of tau minus two and then we'd be multiplying it by our h of t minus tau so that just means wherever i see my variable in h i'm going to substitute in t minus tau so that would be u of t minus tau minus one all that d tau now your question is either how do i apply what i'm going to call squire's rule to this this section how do I simplify that in terms of changing the, um, the limits? Or your question is about if I was to do it graphically, and when I do it graphically, we do that, that flip and shift method. So we, we keep our x of t the same, we just change it to h of tau. And I'm spending some time on this equation because I have a feeling it it's not just you with this, equation, with this question, it's a bunch of people. So here's our x of tau. And then we're going to flip our h of t minus tau. And so that's going to be something that starts up here and comes down. So we've just taken this guy and flipped it around. And we're going to have to um, here. So this is this is u of tau minus two. And this is going to be u of t minus tau minus one. So I guess I need to have a, a value of t for this. So just to give me something to start with, I'm going to always start with t equals zero. That just lets me flip it right around the axis. And then this becomes minus one. And so this whole section we're doing graphically is true only for uh, y of zero. This is, this is all of what ha is happening. We're, gonna, we're calculating y of zero here. In other words, this whole section is, is, is going to force t equals zero, which only, has a, which only matters for this middle thing. And then we multiply these two guys together. And you can see that there's no place where there are ones. So the output is going to be zero. So that therefore our y of zero is equal to the integral under this line, which will be zero. But now to see what it is for other things, we're going to start shifting this guy back and forth. So for time greater than zero, we're going to shift it over here. And I think you can see that not only is it y of zero, y at zero is zero, but as we shift it to the right by one, it'll still be zero. If we shift it to the right by two, it'll still be zero. In fact, it'll be zero for any t less than three. It's gonna take three shifts of this over before it finally just starts to overlap with this, which means when we multiply it, we won't get all zeros. And then as we shift it further and further over, we'll have a steadily increasing amount of overlap. And so therefore, we can start to see that our y of t is going to look like zero for time less than three. Or it's going to look like something that's going to go up evenly with t for time greater than t. We could graph that. by saying it looks like this. And then you could back it into something to a, to a more formal kind of equation in, in here. Dom, is, is, is that the second thing you're asking about the, the graphical, or do you still wanna see the simplification of how, of what this is? Either way, we've actually solved this entire problem. I think I, can, I got it past the point of what you just did. The part I had a question about was the, uh, the y of zero, where t equals zero, that second set of graphs there in the middle. Right. I, I, think, I, I think I got it now. You got it? Do you want to see, so this, so this, we solved the problem. We set it up in two different ways. This method is the graphical, but we did not finish the, 
this part, which is the, uh, the, the calculus, the, what I'm going to call the math. Do you feel comfortable changing this section? We, did, we didn't touch that into a change in variables, into a change in limits. What does anyone want to see me do that? I'd actually like to see you do that. Okay. So I don't know what everyone's screen resolution is and I don't want to go too small on it, but let's say this was even more complicated. Let's say this was times a decaying exponential and this was times a decaying exponential. Hopefully everybody can see that when we stick it together into this formula, we're still going to have these U's these two step functions multiplied by each other. And then we're just going to have it multiplied by whatever this is doing for time after it turns on. So the difficulty here is not integrating that extra part. This is the difficult part that I've got right now. If you get this, then you can easily figure out what it is for a more complicated X of T, you know, that might look like this times E to the minus seven T. So let's, let's just see what, this thing looks like. To see what this thing looks like, we've got to graph it. There's no way around it. And the only way we can graph it is to graph it in two separate sections. We graph the first part and you know what that looks like. It looks, we've, we've, we've done that up here. Turns on at two. And then we have to graph the second part. And the second part's trickier because it's got two variables, t and tau. We know we're, since we're integrating with respect to tau, that's our, that's our variable. So now we need to give ourselves a value of what, of what t is, just to, just to punch it down at one particular level. And that's exact, we're doing now sort of what we did, with, very similar to what we did with the graphical convolution. So let's give ourselves a non, um, zero value of, of t. Let's, let's let t equal one just to see kind of what it looks like. And if we do that, it's going to look like, um, if we do that, it's going to look like, it gets complicated, right? U of one minus tau minus one. Ugh. Of course, we can kind of see, luckily, the 1 minus 1 cancels, and now we're just left with u of minus tau. And now we can see that that looks like this. In general, if we were to allow t to be anything, it would go... Now, the problem is, is here we, don't, we still don't get any overlap. So let's give it a bigger value of, of, I mean, we can see what this is. This will be zero. So let's give it a bigger value of t. Let's make t equal, let's try this again. And this time, let's make t equal uh, three. When we make t equals three, now all of a sudden we get u of three minus tau minus one, which is u of two minus tau, which is, let's figure this out. It changes when the argument to u is zero. So it changes when tau is equal to two. And if tau is really big, let's say tau is a hundred, this thing would be clearly u of a negative number. So when tau is big, this thing is zero. When tau is really small, when tau is negative 100, this would be u of 102, so it's clearly big. So this thing looks like this. So now we can, whoops. I should have drawn, this is always my axis. This is always my zero axis here. Hmm. This was close, but it's still not quite enough to get a non-zero number, is it? So let's let's make it let's make it even bigger. Let's let's make this now t equals four. And when we do four, 
Finally, we have four minus one is three. And now finally we have something that turns on. Now we've got something that, uh, that turns on at three. And for large values of tau, it becomes zero. And for small values, it becomes one. Okay. Now, although it's true that this particular thing does turn on at three, if we let, if we let t be any number greater than something, greater than when it turns on here, if we allow it to be any number that's greater than or equal to three, it will look like, let's try it for, for tau equals five, for tau equals five, it would, this thing would just be four. So in general, it's gonna be, it's gonna be whatever T is minus one. Sir, I had a, I had a question. Go why on. would you, why would you say T greater than or equal to three? Why not when it was four that you had put in to make it three? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll explain why in a second. What we really care about, this, it always looks like, no matter what our, our T is, it always looks like, it always looks like this, right? No matter what we put our, no matter what value of T we choose, it's something that's always one for, for really negative times, and then for really positive times, it's zero. And when does it make that transition? It's T minus one. It's always equal to that. We're, we're, we're graphing, remember we're graphing this is the graph of this portion of our equation. And so no matter what our value of t is, it always trends, it always goes from a positive one to a zero at t minus one, always. So the reason why I wrote this down here is because if our t is less than well, this is always true no matter what our t value is. Maybe it would be more accurate. Everything that I've written is accurate, but maybe it's less confusing if I say this. Forget that for now. And the point that I want to make is that when I multiply this times this, when I want to multiply everything inside this integral, I want to get, that's what I want to integrate. And here I get this. I get a box and it goes between two and T minus one. But I only get that box for T greater than or equal to three, because if T is less than three, can you see how this box goes down to zero with? And so if T is less than three, I end up with something that just, after I multiply them through, I end up getting something that looks like this. Is that clear, right. Dom? Yes, sir. One, one last thing. The T minus one on the right half of the, where it where the signal drops back down, could you explain that again? Sure. Like well, on, the, on the bottom box, like it goes, I get it goes up. This, yeah, this comes from this. So this waveform in, I'm going to change my colors here. I have a, I have this section. That is what I'm graphing first. And then I've got a pink section. That's what I'm graphing here. And then I'm going to multiply them through to make the whole green section. And that's what I get down here. So why is it T minus one over here? Because if I when I multiply, I'm multiplying orange times pink. So when I multiply orange times pink, I get zero times one is zero. I get zero times one, which is zero. I get zero times one, which is zero. For time greater than two, I get one times one, which is one. I get one times one, which is one. 
But now for time greater than t minus one, I get one times zero, which is zero. So I, it's only going to be non-zero between two and t minus one when I multiply orange times pink. Is that clear? Sir, I have a question. Shoot. Uh, at t equals three, though, wouldn't, because it's t minus one, it, wouldn't there still yeah, be yeah, a yeah, width? If you feel better doing this, we could do that. It's the same thing. At, at t equals, at t exactly, uh, let me clear it. Let me clearly mark this. This is at t minus one. So if we set t equals three and we want to use this graph, we'd end up having something that at two, it turns on and then at three minus one at two, it turns off. And so we'd end up having something when we multiply it through that would be this. It goes up to height of one. And either way, it doesn't make a difference if you want to use this graph or this graph, because either way, now that we've done all this part up here, now we're going to integrate it. And what's the integral of the area underneath this red line? It's zero. What's the area of the, of the area underneath this red line? It's zero. My, my question way, is three, we the, have zero. the first graph on the left of the or because you still have equals to three greater than or equal to three there. Uh -huh. But three would make it zero, wouldn't it? That's three would make it look exactly like I've drawn to the right. Mm -hmm. and, so, and now the next question is, this is not our answer. This is not why neither of these graphs at the bottom are y of zero. What this graph is, is this up here. So to find what, what our y is, we've got to integrate them. So uh, Jonathan, what's the integral of this over all time? What's the area underneath the red curve? Zero. Zero. So what you've just shown to me is that y of three, when t equals three, y of three is zero. Now look at what we did graphically. We've shown it's, we've shown y of t equals three is zero. But we've shown that for t any greater than three is going to be non-zero. And sure enough, for, for y of t any greater than three, we're going to start to pull this out and get some sort of little hat going. So all that we're doing here is just breaking apart this integral equation. We're graphing the first part. We're graphing the second part. We multiply them together. And then we get something that looks like down here, depending upon if our t is greater than three or t is less than three. So if you've got, the lesson here is that if you've got um, systems that can be entirely des described by box tops, I would do it graphically because this was really easy to see. But if you've got things that have e to the minus, if you've got anything else, then you'd have to do it this way. But even that isn't that hard. What we found here is that you're going to evaluate one of two different integrals. Your integral is either going to be on the left between two and t minus one, d tau, if t is greater than three, or it's going to simply, or you're going to be taking the integral of zero d tau for t less than, I'm sorry, for t less than three. So this is, this is powerful stuff. Does that answer your question, Jonathan? Well, the question is, on the left part of the graph, you still have t is greater than or equal to 3. And I thought that was the part of the graph where it's, um, the area is supposed to be greater than 0. It is. That's correct. The, the area underneath this thing is greater than 0. And take a look at the right. So the area underneath this is what we're going to integrate. So the area is equal to the output. So for t greater than three, we'll have a greater than zero output. Take a look at what our actual answer is for, out for y of t. For time greater than three, we've got a non-zero greater than zero output. So that's correct. But why is it equal to three? 
the, the, the symbol there is greater than or equal to. Yeah. If it makes you feel better, let's change it. Change it to, change it to, uh, change it to t strictly greater than three. And then for any t less than or equal to, to three, we get this. Does that make yeah, you feel better? That, Either way, yeah. it's the same graph. Either way, it's zero up until three, and then it starts to go up. Okay. Maybe, maybe what you're dying to know is what does this thing look like? And the answer to this would be equal to uh, t minus three for t greater than three. All right, so this is what we get. Whether or not we put an equal sign here or here is equivalent to whether or not we put an equal sign on the top or on the bottom. And it doesn't matter. Either way, you get the exact same graph. Either way, at time equals three, your output is zero. Because either way, you either have this infinitesimally small one height box with a width of zero, which has an area of zero, or else you just have a zero line, which is zero. Okay. Okay, I wanted to spend some time on that just to make sure everyone felt, felt comfortable with that. I didn't expect to do an entire problem, but today's lesson is actually fast comparatively. Um, so let's get into it. Today's lesson, is all about Laplace transforms and circuits. So all these assume you do not have initial conditions. And then we'll talk about ones with initial conditions. Initial conditions means that you've got a capacitor that's charged up or a um, inductor that's initially got some current going through it. So let's talk about it. By the way, the, the problems I just did, there's no way to, to, it just requires practice. It's one of those things that just requires seeing it done a few times, maybe rewinding this part of the video a bunch of times until then you can, until you can do it alone. And it, and it really does require a lot of practice. There's, there's going back, having the idea that the output is an integral, that our y of t is the integral of this, is the part that's confusing for most students. They think that, man, once they do through all the work of coming up with the first part times the second part, this should be y of t, and it's not. This whole thing is y of t is the area underneath this for one particular t. So to find, so to graph this entire function, you've got to do an infinite number of these things for every possible t value. Okay, so what we've been talking about so long with this in this course is transforming our input using Laplace transforms, transforming our impulse response using Laplace transforms, and then finding the output inverse Laplace transforming it to finding the output in the time domain. But one part of this that, we've never, that we haven't talked about is given a circuit, how do I find its H of S? And that's what today's lecture is gonna be. And it's actually a very simple one. I'm gonna talk about in the time domain that a resistor looks like this. In the frequency domain with no initial conditions. So here's the problem. The frequency domain can't handle initial conditions. There's no concept of time in the frequency domain. So we're going to have to somehow redo things to get rid of initial conditions if there are some. But luckily, resistors have no initial conditions, so they look the exact same either with or without initial conditions. Can't have initial conditions with a resistor. And that's it. Resistors become resistors in the frequency domain. Now, capacitors are a different story. A capacitor, and remember, it might have some sort of initial condition. I'll call that VC of zero. 
in the frequency domain, if you don't have any initial conditions, if VC of zero is zero, it looks like this component. Can anyone, does anyone remember what the impedance of a capacitor looks like in the phaser domain from EE223? What is it? Is it one over JC? Almost one over J A W C Omega C. So in other words, take a look, this omega, this J omega, if you could just convert that into an S, it's actually even simpler and you've got it. You don't have to spend much time memorizing that. Now, unfortunately, again, as I said, frequency domain cannot tolerate anything to do with, um, doesn't understand time. So we're gonna have to rewrite this radically if it has, if it has an initial condition. And it just so happens that even in the time domain, if you rewrite a capacitor with an initial condition as a capacitor in series with a voltage source, you can, you can, you can do that. So in other words, if this thing has a non-zero VC of naught, you can rewrite this as one over SC as an uncharged capacitor in series with our voltage source. But of course, if it's a voltage source in the time domain, it would have to be divided by S in the frequency domain. And let me rewrite that S a little bit more clearly. This is what I want you to give brain cells to. That's brain cells. This is what I want you to memorize. If you memorize this, then you can easily, if it's, if it's a zero initial condition, then this part just goes away. Then we've got our inductor. And it might have some sort of initial condition of I sub L of zero. Anyone want to take a guess about what it looks like in the frequency domain? Given the fact that you may remember that in the phaser domain, it looks like a resistance of J omega L. BSL. L That's over it. S. Uh, Sabine, you're right, SL. Because all again we're doing is just replacing our J omega with an S. And it's the same thing. In fact, in a very deeper mathematical way, you'll see that the J omega gets converted to an S in the frequency domain. All right, so then what the heck do we do if it has an initial condition? Instead of placing a voltage source in parallel, we're gonna place a current source, current source in, series. in series. And it's the same thing. And since we're in the frequency domain, we need to divide that by S. Okay, this is the other thing you need to know. There is one other way that we can write these things if we want to. You can do a source transform of this. And if you do a source transform, you may remember that Voltage sources in parallel in series go to current sources in parallel. And to find current, you always use Ohm's law. It's voltage divided by resistance. It's voltage divided by the resistance. Here, the S's cancel, and you end up just with C, V, C naught. Or you can change two things in parallel into two things in series where your current source changes into a voltage source. Notice this was tending to make things move up. So this tends to make things move up. This tends to make things move down. So this tends to make things move down. Um, you could reverse the directions of one and you just reverse the direction of the other two. There's nothing magical about the transforms directions where this is S, still SL, the impedance stays the same. And now to con change a current into a voltage, you multiply these two, the S's cancel, and now you get L, I sub L at zero. 
where these are, these are lowercase isobel. The, this is our initial condition. So don't waste brain cells on this. This is just the source transform. I'm showing them to you because sometimes it's easier to write them one way or the other. And you might see in different books um, or different videos you watch them written as this in, in the transform or in, the, um, or in this domain. Okay. Believe it or not, that's everything. There's nothing more to this lesson. Everything else is just going to be an example. So let me give an example. Um, Okay, so here's an example of something that would be almost impossible to analyze. It'd be very difficult to analyze and using EE222 techniques. The best that you could do is, is come up with a long set of differential equations that modeled it, um, and that would be tough to do. But watch how easy it is in frequency domain. Oh, so the, and our goal, and to tell you what you need to find, is let's find uh, the voltage across the capacitor so therefore I'd better define it. Find the voltage across the capacitor for time greater than or equal to zero. If, and just to make it harder, let's give that capacitor an initial charge. So it's got an initial charge and then at time equals zero, this thing, poof, pushes a whole bunch of current through. How much? Two coulombs of of, uh, of charge, pushes it in here, that'll probably make this voltage even rise up a little bit more. <coughs> this thing's working at the same time with some amount of voltage that looks like this, and it all seems pretty complicated. Here's how to do it. So the first is to transform to the time domain. I'm sorry. You're already in the time domain. We're going to transform to the frequency domain. So in the frequency domain, where would you still expect after we transform it to find variables T? Anyone? After we transform it to the frequency domain, where can we expect to find a variable T? The answer nowhere? Nowhere, exactly. So that's just a good check to make sure if you've done it right. So this guy, 10 e to the minus t, um, John Arger, what does that transform to? Uh, that would be, oh shoot. I'm not sure I've got blanked out right now, sir. Okay, uh, Preston, you wanna help him? Preston? I'm thinking real quick. All right, so these, these decaying exponentials, you should just Is know by now. One over S plus one? That's right, except because it's times 10, it'll be 10 over S plus one. All right, so we've got our, our resistors don't change at all. Now we're gonna have to change this capacitor to look like either this or this. I'm gonna just leave that out for a second while I transform our current source. What's the, what is the transform of two times an impulse? Uh, Philip, Phil? That is a two S? Not quite. Is it two um, over S? 
Uh, so it, it would be two if it was two u of t, yeah. it would go to two over s. But it's not u of t; it's impulse of t. So it's even easier. It's just simply two. Is it just two? Oh, yeah. Okay. That's it. So now we just have to transform this guy, which, which seems like it's a, which would seem like a better choice to put in this version or to put in this version? Left or right? We could do either one. I would well, say right. If you transform, you could uh, combine your current sources. Yeah, that's it. Definitely the right. So one over SC, let's see, but our one over C is 10. So that gives us 10 over S. And now we've got our current source that's one tenth right? One tenth times its initial value. Its initial value is five. So that's going to be one half. And that's our first step. That seems like a whole lot easier. Oh, don't forget, really easy to lose track of what you're trying to find. I'm going to write it in capital letters now just to just remind me that I'm in the frequency domain. So now this looks... I'm sorry, sir. I, I missed that. You went, you went from... Um... One tenth to ten over s. I, I'm sorry. Uh huh. So our 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 impedance in the frequency domain for a capacitor is equal to one over s c. That's just what it's defined as over here. Oh oh, one over one, one tenth over s times okay. one tenth times Thanks. ten over s. Thank you. Yeah. So now we got to simplify this. How would you like to simplify this? Combine the current sources? Definitely combine sources on the right. What can we do with the overall? Do you want to, um, two ways to do this. One way is to do it more graphically. That's the way I would tend to do it if you can. And that would be to do a source transform of, source transform of this. So that's see, we, that would give us a, and this way we'd have everything in parallel. So this is more positive up. So it's like an arrow going up. We divide voltage by uh, resistance. So that just gives us a one over S plus one. Those tens cancel. And now we've got a 10 in parallel with a 10 in parallel with a 10 over S in parallel with, and since these guys are going in the same direction, I'm just going to simplify as Jonathan said, two plus a half is 2.5. I'll, I'll just call it five halves. And we have not changed what we want to find, which is that voltage, which of course is the same voltage as anywhere on the top and the bottom. So I'm just going to bring it right out. Okay, now the question is, do we want to use mesh? We've got one, two, three, four meshes. Use nodal. If we put a ground down here, we just have one nodal, so that's way better than using four meshes. I don't think I would do either though. I think I would just simplify. Because these 10, all these guys are in are in parallel, right? So you already know what ten in parallel with ten is. What what is it, um, Charles? Uh, five, sir. Yeah, that's just five. So we've got our five here, and we've got our ten over s here. And it doesn't matter if we draw it on the left or the right. These guys are still going in the same direction. They're still pointing upwards. So that's one over S plus five over two. Now, one over S plus one plus five over two. Now here's a secret. Always get things in ratios of polynomials. So this is not a ratio of polynomial. So let's do the algebra to make it a ratio of, poly a ratio of polynomials right now before we go, before we go any further. Um, We'd like to get these things both over two. We'd like to get these things both, we can multiply 
top and bottom here by two. So that's this guy. We can similarly multiply this guy by s plus one, top and bottom. And so now we can add them up because the denominators are the same. And that gives us um, 5s plus 5 plus 2 is plus 7, all over 2 times s plus 1. All right. That might not seem any, any uh, simpler than this, but trust me, because this is a ratio of polynomials, in the future, things will simplify down a lot better. Now, we still want to find this voltage. So now we can simplify these two guys. These are in parallel. And what's the equation for five in parallel with 10 over S? It's equal to product over sums. That's definitely not a simple ratio of polynomials. So what do we want to multiply top and bottom to get rid of this divided by S? We want to multiply it by S. So we want to multiply top by S and bottom by S. That gives us 50 over 5S plus 10. Okay, that is a ratio of polynomials. So that says all this is the same as this one weird circuit. I'm going to draw it as a resistor, even though it's a resistor in parallel with a capacitor. And it has the equivalent impedance of 50 over 5s. Oh, you know what? I can, I can uh, divide through top and bottom by 5 and simplify that too, right? So that would be 10 over s plus 2 if I divide top and bottom through by 5. And this is neither a resistor nor a capacitor, but something kind of weirdly in between. And it's got a current source pushing current through it of 5s plus 7 all over 2s plus 1. And our goal is to find out the voltage across it. So therefore, it's going to be just the product. So that gives us 10 over s plus 2 all times 5s plus 7 over 2 s plus 1. And remember, we always want to don't ever, and even, in, even in an intermediate step, don't let the algebra get the best of you. Switch it always over into a polynomial ratio. So the numerator here would be, um, let's see, we could simplify this a little bit. Divide through by 2. That gives us 5. So that would be 25 s plus 35 over s plus 1, s plus 2. And now this looks just like a problem from two classes ago when you did your inverse Laplace transform. Quick check, is this a proper or an improper uh, fraction, Sabine? This is proper. This is proper, so we don't need to divide through. So it's going to be equal to something over s plus 1 plus something over s plus 2. To find out what the S plus 1 is, we just cover up that S plus 1 part on our left. We cover up this part. And we say, and we plug in negative 1 for S. So that gives us minus, 20, minus 25 plus 35 is 10. And negative 1 plus 2 is 1. So this first number is just 10. Plugging in, we'll cover up our S plus 2 here and plug in S equals negative 2. That gives us negative 50 plus 35 is negative 15. And negative 1 plus 1 is negative 1. So this whole thing just equals positive 15. And now we can write down our answer. BC of t is equal to 10 e to the minus t plus 15 e to the minus 2t. The whole thing times u of t, that's absolutely necessary to put in and you're done. How cool is that? We've changed a really complicated equation filled with decaying exponentials and impulses down into just a simple circuits one problem.
Any questions on that? I had a question. Are we ever going to need to do on a test the integral uh, version of the convolution or can we just do Laplace transforms? You need to be able to do it both ways. You need to do it for not only my test, you'll need to be able to do it both ways for your FE exam. You'll need to do it both ways if you go to grad school. Um, but when you actually work problems, unless you're told you've got to use the integral, don't. Use Laplace. It's, it's always easier. Thank you. Sure. And that's the reason why I make you learn how to do it using the integral method is because you will see it on the FE. You will see it in graduate school. Um, and I need you to be prepared for that. But once you work them a few times, <laughs> it's funny, this lesson was all about Laplace transforms and circuits. And you got that spat so fast, but you're still concerned about last lesson, which is the convolution. Um, I was not prepared to brief a full problem in convolution, so I hadn't thought this out in advance. What I will do is um, I'll make another video in which I work out a problem like this, but that I have thought out in advance. So, and I'll work it out from beginning to end. So the, the problem here is that we, we, we started working on various things because I was answering a question and I didn't realize it would, it would evolve into working the whole problem. If I had started off to work the whole problem, I would have approached it a little differently. Sir, I also have a question about the convolution. Um, it's just, it's not, I mean, I don't, I don't know we're running out of time, so I, I could yeah. save it for later. No, we're, we're not. We've got, we've got a quarter of an hour. Oh, okay. Um, so when you find the area underneath that wave, after you've multiplied your two, um, functions essentially your u of t functions after yes. you graph them out you find the integral you find that area that area is true for the rest of the wave so if i were to have that same it's, essentially sit uh essentially signal I, it's the exact same area that's why the the only the for that one time period that you've chosen to draw it so but i was trying to relate it to why the integral area y of t versus t is is linear yeah so i did i again if i had realized i was going to work the whole problem i would have done a bunch of different steps and then we'd have seen it okay we've got time i've got time before my next class i'm done with the material for this class and i've got examples of collaborative problems posted that let you work through today's class so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to rework this class this this problem as if I was actually reworking the whole thing and not as if I was going to poke at the problem at different parts, answering specific student questions. Because it seems like a lot of you are still struggling with the overall aspect about how to do convolution and what do the parts look like. Is that generally a fair statement? For some of you, I think you already have it. And if you already have it, by all means, feel free to leave the, the session. But a lot of it, I think you're, you're still struggling with how it all fits together. Is that a fair statement? Yes, sir. I, I'm uh, okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me let me do the whole thing. Um, how, in terms of between the math version and the graphical version, math versus flip and sli uh, slip versus flip and slide, is either one giving you more heartache or are they both equal? It's the graphical for me. Pretty much equal. <laughs> Pretty much equal or graphical. Okay, because. Okay, I could I could use practice in, in both though. I mean, I'm I understand. I'm not I'm not expert like Give me one second. I'm just going to write down this example, and then I'm going to solve it from soup to nuts on the next next page. If you want to stay with me, you can. And if you'd like to leave, you can do that too. And we've got another 15 minutes to do that. And I think that that's plenty of time. Okay, so I'm going to work a convolution example. And 
and I'm going to do it both using calculus and I'm going to do it graphically. I'm going to begin graphical. Now, for in order to be able to solve anything graphical using the graphical method, they have to have flat tops. So in other words, something like x of t equals u of t minus 2 and h of t, an impulse response that looks like uh, u of, of t minus 1. That's an okay thing to do graphically because the final step is going to be to multiply them and then to just find the area by inspection. By, and you can find the area of a, of a rectangle, of a rectangle by inspection, but trying to find the area of a something with rectangular sides, but with a decaying exponential top, you can't do just by inspection. So the graphical method only works if you've got flat tops. And we'll, we'll use this one as an example. So it's important to first, before we go into the graphical, remind ourselves what the formula is for convolution. And the formula is we're going to take the integral of x of tau times h of t minus tau d tau. So that confuses a lot of students because we have both a t variable and a tau variable. And the tau variable is a dummy variable of, of integration. It goes away in the answer, so your answer is just going to be a, a, a value of t. But you've got to reevaluate this integral. This, this integral gets reevaluated for every possible different t value. So the graphical method just takes this integral and does it by parts. It graphs this part, it graphs this part, it graphs the product of the two parts, and then it finds the area underneath them. Now, that is that depends upon your answer, your integral, depends upon what your t is. So we're going to have to do it for a bunch of different values of t. And so let's do it starting off for a particular value of t. Let's start it off for t equals 5. And there's nothing magical about t equals 5. You could have chosen any t from negative infinity to positive infinity. But in fact, I'm going to start it off with an even simpler one. I'm going to start it off with the simplest possible. And I'm going to recommend that in general you do the same. Start off for t equals zero. Always. So if we start off with t equals zero, you're first going to graph your, your x. Now we never actually, oh, here's our x. This is what our x is. So we are going to graph x of tau in orange. And our x of tau is our same thing as our x of t. Just every time we see a t in here, we're going to replace it with a tau. So that's u of tau minus 2. So we know that it pops, it changes when the argument of u is 0. And the argument of u is 0 is when tau equals 2. So we'll graph that. And then for large values of tau, we can see that this argument is going to be positive. And for very negative values of tau, we can see this, this whole argument will be negative, which means that the u, the step function, will be 0. And we get that. So this is the, the graph of x of tau. And that's this first part of the integral. The second part of the integral in green Let me just, again, make it really clear where we're evaluating what. This whole column is going to refer to, this whole column is going to refer to this integral evaluated t equals 0. And our top graph is our x of tau, which we said is equal to u of tau minus 2. Our second graph is this green one that we're going to be graphing. This is going to be our h of t minus tau. Now, what is t minus tau for this particular example? It's this. h of t is this.
So we're just going to graph, we're going to write down our u, and every time we see a, our independent variable in our h of t, we'll replace it with t minus tau. So we see it, our independent variable here, we replace it with t minus tau, and we're going to subtract from that one. But wait, for this particular problem, we said we're going to start off with t equals zero. So for this particular one, we're going to just simply graph h of minus tau, which is the same thing as graphing minus tau minus one, since t equals zero. And we're going to have to graph a whole bunch of these different, we're going to have to do a whole bunch of these different vertical graphs to see what's going on in the different time regions. So let's graph this. So here we've got, what does this thing look like? It, it changes when, it's, when the argument to u is zero. The argument to u is zero when tau is equal to negative one. So at negative one, something, something's going on with this. And does it, what is it for really big values of, of tau, for really big positive values of tau? You can see this argument is negative and similarly, similarly, for really negative values of tau, we're talking about tau because that's what we're integrating with respect to. For really negative values of tau, this, the argument will become positive, so u of t becomes one. Now, the last part is we're gonna multiply these two guys together. And when we multiply them together, st still this tau, we're gonna have this whole thing. We're gonna have x of tau times h of t minus tau. So then we just need to find the integral when we're done. Okay, and I'm not gonna, I don't need to figure out what this is directly because I've already drawn the first part, the second part. So now I'm just gonna do an element by element multiplication. It's zero for this part. So this is gonna be zero, it's zero over here. When at negative one, does anything happen? No, because it's still gonna be zero up here. So it's still gonna be zeros out here. It's zeros in the middle because the, they're both zero here. It's zero in the right because this is zero. So this is just zero everywhere. So therefore, for the particular region, and remember we're, this, is, this, is, this whole column is still, is still for t equals zero. So now we can finally find y of t equals zero. And that's gonna be the, the area underneath this. And just by inspection, it's zero. So this is the first part, the flip. Let's now do it for a different time. I'll say arbitrarily, let's try it for t equals one. All right, so our first part doesn't change because there's no time in our first one. It's, it's just tau. It still looks like this and it pops up. So this is our still our x of tau. Now we're gonna draw the second part. Now this does change, right? Because when we're graphing this part, still always with respect to tau, when we're graphing the second part, this is our u of t minus tau minus one. This is in, in general we're graphing this. In general we're graphing h of t minus tau. For this particular problem that becomes u of t minus tau minus one. And then since our t is equal to one, that means we're going to graph one minus tau minus one, which is just the same thing as saying u of one minus one cancels and so we just get minus tau. So this looks like this, boom, boom, boom. Okay, now we'll multiply them together to find out what our y is at t equals one, which is gonna be the area again underneath that, that, that product curve, which is what we said is our, is our integral. So when we multiply these guys together, we get zero times one is zero and zero times one is zero and it just stays, you know, once again, zero over here. This is still zero, this is still zero. No matter where we go, it's always zero. So the area of x of tau times h of t 
t minus tau for t equals one is also going to be zero. Now, when you're doing this, the only thing that you're really changing is not this first one, but you're only changing the second one. And you, and you can see when we switch from t equals zero, at t equals zero, we just flipped around our original h of t. And then we slid it forward when we moved one unit forward in time to find y of t equals one. And we could continue to this. We could, you, can, you can see that as we flip it through, it's going to stay zero all the way up until it comes up to up until here, it's gonna stay zero. So let's see what happens when we get to t equals, when we flip it forward by two more and draw it for t equals three. Does something special happen? Our first one, our x of tau, is still stayed the same. It's still from the very beginning, it's still u of t minus, uh, I'm sorry, u of tau minus two. And the only reason why I keep drawing it over and over is to make it easy to multiply these two things. You do not need to keep drawing it through. Now though, when we draw our h of t minus tau, which in general is u of t minus tau minus one for this particular, it's in general h of t minus tau. For this particular problem, it's h of, it's u of t minus tau minus one. And in this time region of t equals three, we finally get u of three minus one, which is two minus tau. And now we've got something that stays down until this argument is zero and this argument is zero at two. And well, we still have the same thing, don't we? When we, when we multiply them through a piece by piece, when we multiply over here, we get zero. When we multiply around here, this is zero, so we still get zero. Let's see, when we multiply over here, this is zero up here, so we still get zero. When we multiply them over here, this is zero, so we still get zero. So therefore, we've shown that y of t equals three, which is, this is t, which is the area underneath this curve, remains zero. Okay. So I think it's clear that if we redid this for time, any time less than zero, all we're doing is we're pushing this further and further off to the left. There's still never gonna be an overlap. And so because of this, y of t for any time less than three will all be zero, just like they were here. As we pull this thing further and further to the left, we're only gonna guarantee that we've still got nothing underneath the product of the two. And so we're always gonna have a zero result. Let's see what we get when we get t equals four. Finally, we'll get something. Now x of tau, which we're growing up above, still hasn't changed at all. It's still something that's zero up until we get to two. And now it pops up. But now something different does happen for here. In general, we're graphing this. For this particular problem, we're graphing this. And since t is equal to four, it becomes four minus one, which is u of three minus tau. And now we get something that pops up until three and then goes down. So now when we multiply the two element by element, we can say we're still multiplying it by zero over here. So this is still gonna be zero. What we're graphing again, just to be clear, is, our, is everything under the integral sign, our x of tau times our h of t minus tau. And it's still is it gonna be zero all the way up to two. But in the region from two to three, we're gonna be multiplying one by one. But then for any value greater than three, this is zero, so that will force it to be zero. So now we've got this, and finally we've got a non-zero area. So now we can say y at t equals four, which is the area 
underneath this graph is equal to one. And we could do the same process again and again for T5, T6, T7, T8. And as we get T equals five, skipping all the, the work, we'll get something that pops up at two and pops down at four. And now when we do the area, y at t equals five, we'll have an area of two. Since it's two wide and it's one tall. So now we can get our graph of our output versus t. And we can see that the graph of the output stays zero until we get to three, and then it rises linearly. And if you don't see that, just simply plot the points for zero, one, two, three, oops, sorry, <laughs> four, five. And what I'd like you to do is, is, is have the sophistication to realize that if we keep this for any t, I'm going to change change colors to make this to make this clearer. If we change this now to any which anti to any t hmm. greater Let's than try that again. Which anti? <laughs> That's my phone talking. If we change this to any t greater than three, because for t less than three, right, we get t less than or equal to three, we get, uh, we get zeros. But if we change it to any t greater than or equal to three, like four or five or six, or even three and a half or 3.1, in general, we'll get a square here, rectangle here, that goes between two and our t minus three. And that means that in general, y of any t will be a rectangle of height one with a width, it'll always be one high, but it'll have a width of between two and t minus three. So t minus three minus two. Well, that's just the same as, this, right? It starts at, it ends at t minus three, it begins at two. So in general, that's gonna be t minus one. And so it's gonna have a height of one, a width of t minus one, Um, where did I go wrong with that? No, that's right. Let me just see if I, did I make a mistake with that? Oh, let me try that again. It always starts at two, but take a look at this last number. This last number, wherever you go, is always going to be one less than your t value. It's always going to go between t and t minus one. And so it will always have a, a width of t minus one minus where you began, which will be t minus three. So it'll have a height of one a width of t minus one, and so we'll have a formula of t minus three. And that's true as long as our t is greater than or equal to three. And so that's another way of saying that this equation here is equal to t minus three for t greater than three. And as I talked to before with Jonathan, it really doesn't matter where we put our equal sign because if we consider this downward sloping line to be what rules it at t equals three or the zero line to be at t equals three, it gives our same response. So either way, we get this or this, and that's the approach using the graphical method. How's that, everyone? That was good. 
Okay. I don't have time to do another one um, using the calculus, but I can say that the calculus approach is similar in coming up with this and here after you graph it you see that you can change our let me switch over here for this particular problem you would change this integral sign from where you had before which is x of tau which is u of t minus 2 and i'm sorry x of tau minus 2 so that's your x of tau part and then your h of tau part, which is your u of um, t minus tau minus 1, where this is the green part that we just did. And you draw a graph similar to, to just one of these, just this part to say that this is equal to one of two things. It's either going to be the integral between where we begin integrating, which is two, up to the maximum place where we integrate, which is t minus one, d tau, or it's equal to zero. And it's equal to zero for t less than three, and it's equal to this for t greater than three. And now if we had a more complicated thing that had sinusoids or decaying exponentials, it would go right in here and now you could do the integral equation. Okay. It's a little bit over at class time. I'll see you next class. And uh, if you've got questions, absolutely email me. This is tough stuff. This is, I think, yes, the sir. hardest, probably the hardest class that's required at, uh, at VMI. Take care, guys. Thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.